Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all participants. My name is Navid Malik, and I'm the Special Advisor at the Commonwealth of Learning, Vancouver. And I welcome you to the fourth webinar in the Future of Learning Thought Leadership Series, organized by the Commonwealth of Learning under its Open Door Initiative. It is our privilege to have as our speaker today, Professor Richard Larson from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dr. Larson is Mitsui Professor, post-tenure in the Institute for Data Systems and Society of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology or MIT as we know it. He's a member of the US National Academy of Engineering. He served as founding director of MIT Link and as principal investigator of MIT Blossoms. His career has focused on finding ways to improve services industries including education, urban service systems, disaster response, disease dynamics, dynamic pricing of critical infrastructures and workforce planning. At MIT, for 25 years, he has served as a leader for initiatives in technology-enabled education, especially secondary and tertiary STEM education in the US and in other countries. His research on the doctoral workforce has been extensively cited including STEM crisis or STEM surplus, yes and yes, which was given the best paper of the year award from the Lawrence M. Klein Fund. Professor Larson, the stage is yours. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. It's an honor to be here, an honor to be invited by the Commonwealth of Learning. I should tell you I'm reporting from my home in Lexington, Massachusetts, which is less than one mile from Lexington Green on April 19th, 1775, was the source of our uh, Revolutionary War. Now, I, I hope I'm still in good uh, hands here in the Commonwealth of Learning, and you won't turn me off when you hear this. Uh, anyway, we have the finest relationships now between the US and Great Britain and the Commonwealth. Basically, we're gonna talk about project-based learning today, allowing every student to shine. And uh, this has been a passion of ours, I'd say for the past uh, half a dozen years or so. So let's get going. So project-based learning, what is it? Well, we take a real world uh, project, a topic to investigate, uh, and we're dealing with teenagers in high school. And we're gonna assign these projects to, uh, to high school uh, STEM classes and students and teams in high school STEM classes. So we want an authentic topic, something that's happening in the student's community. It's gonna have uh, uh, issues that the students think they can have a positive impact on. And it's a question for now not historical or not of the future. It's something that has meaning in the students' lives. And uh, here's an example of uh, a, a student project out in the field doing some ecology or some biology research, uh, this sort of thing. Okay, so the idea is in the 21st century, students need to know a lot more than just facts that, have, that are derived from lecture board, uh, that blackboard lecturing the industrial kind of the Model T Ford uh, 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 mass production process we've been using for education for a hundred years or so. So we need to develop critical thinking skills, problem solving skills. We need to uh, support creativity and imagination, thinking out of the box, collaboration, and self-directed discovery learning. So, so STEM education is much more than just uh, memorizing the Pythagorean theorem and having to prove it or uh, knowing in physics, uh, 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 Newton's three laws of motion, although they have to know those things, but it's much more now. So, and also students have so many diversions these days. So we have to capture their interest, get them excited and get them engaged. And I put engagement in red and bold because without student engagement, it's not gonna work. So standard lecturing, uh, unfortunately often falls short in this mode. And uh, I know there are some teachers watching here today. Thank you very much for, for participating. And I know that none of you ever taught a class that, that, re that responded like this. So th this is just a separate class. Nobody here is involved. Time Magazine said, you know, had a cover, how to build a student for the 21st century. And some of these things are called soft skills, but I think for most people, they're harder to, ma to, to master than the Pythagorean theorem or the quadratic equation or all these other things. So these soft skills are problem solving, creativity, critical thinking. 
So it aims to promote student-centered uh, thinking, experiential uh, approaches. And uh, so it's gonna add education through interactive collaboration and exploring real world challenges. And uh, it's gonna be open-ended. So a lot of students maybe feel a little uncomfortable with that. And they're gonna have to design a project uh, plan. So in, in, in our view of project-based learning, we treat these teenagers as adults. And as adults, they have to do both the hard sciences and, and, and technology and math and, and, and the soft skills as well. So they're gonna to have to come up with a project plan. They're gonna have complex tasks because they have a schedule. They have to put all this together. And at the end, they'll have a product, which probably will be a combination of a written report, concrete recommendations, and an oral report. And their oral report will be not only to the class and the students, but also to parents and hopefully to people in the community who have responsibility for the topic that they just investigated. Here are some students outside and engaged in project-based learning. So the students need now two kinds of skills. The fundamental skills are reading, writing, and arithmetic or STEM. STEM, for those of you who uh, don't know, is science, technology, engineering, and math. And these digital age 21st century skills. Okay. So let's think of the traditional way of teaching STEM. So here we have a, a teacher, maybe he's a professor in front of a class and the blackboard is, or a green board is loaded with lots of math equations and the students are dutifully uh, recording this either on a notepad or onto their uh, laptops uh, uh, in front of them. So that's one way of thinking about teaching STEM, which is more or less the traditional way for, for many, many decades. And in my view, I like to think of images. When I, when I think of a, of, of, of a situation going on, I like to think of images. My image of that is mother bird shoving partially digested food down the throats of her chicks. Where the, the teacher's responsibility is to deliver content to the students. The students dutifully type it under the computer or, or write it in the notepads. They memorize it. They regurgitate it back at, at, at an exam or a quiz a week or so later. And then sometimes they dutifully forget it. Now think of teaching STEM this way. Here we have students who are working outside, taking pictures, collecting data, uh, doing something in nature, and this is maybe a biology or an ecology class, uh, doing a project. And in my view, the image of this is mother bird teaching her chicks how to fly. And so the project-based learning is more in that mode rather than in the regurgitation mode. So here we have um, a bunch of people, students, uh, sitting and listening to a lecture. And uh, we might say, if everyone loves PBL, project-based learning, uh, why isn't it used more widely? Well, uh, we've talked to you know, thousands of teachers during our 12 years working with the MIT Blossoms Project, which I'll describe a little bit more in a, in a bit. And um, we have found that high school STEM teachers have been reluctant to employ it in their classrooms. Some do, the majority do not. And we hear words like this, too much time taken away from state mandated curricula. Or uh, in the US, we have the SAT and the ACT tests, which are standardized tests. And sometimes the college or university you get admitted to is closely related to the score you get on that. We need to teach these national standardized tests or too much teacher preparation time. Uh, or you know, doing that requires more content knowledge than I have. And there's a, a bullet here I haven't put. And, and basically, a lot of teachers we've talked to, when you say project-based learning, they think of the, of the next three to five weeks, which are going to be the project, and the students are going to work on it, both in class and, and, and outside of school, inter interacting by internet or in, in teams, maybe on weekends. Uh, they say, I have no idea how to manage this. This is something totally foreign to me. I have not been skilled in my uh, education classes in college how to do this. And this seems to be... If, if you don't know how to manage this, this could result in total chaos. So I think I'm going to uh, avoid it. Okay, so that's the case. And the majority of teachers have not done this or they've done it once maybe and it was not a successful thing. So how do we deal with this? Well, what we've done at MIT with our MIT Blossoms PBL project, which just was completed uh, two months ago in September. And we're happy to say that today is our first public dissemination of our results first public dissemination of the PBL products 
that we've created, which are all open source, freely available worldwide. We've created for the novice teacher or the teacher who, who you know, avoids this, a complete scaffolding of the PBL process. So again, images, I love images, especially you know, in PowerPoints, you need to see eye candy as well as, as well as textual bullets. Okay, so MIT Blossoms. So Blossoms is, uh, has completed just its, its 12th year. Blossoms stands for Blended Learning Open Source Science or Math Studies. We have about 200 Blossoms lessons in STEM. And each one takes one class time, 50 minutes to 60 minutes to go through. And the Blossoms lessons are in two to four minute video segments. So there's a two to four minute video segment in which a challenge is given to the class. And then the teacher turns the video off and then guides the class through answering, addressing that challenge over the next four to five minutes in an active in-class discussion. As soon as the challenge is solved, then the teacher goes back and presses the video button again, and the next video segment comes up. And there's more stuff that goes on and more concepts and another challenge, and the video goes off. And it oscillates this way back and forth. Maybe there are four to six different video segments in a one hour class and four to six different active learning uh, in the class. So with blended learning, it's the in-class teacher who's still in charge of her class or his class. And then there's the Blossoms of video teacher. And um, our project-based learning uh, products, our units uh, are anchored around uh, uh, Blossoms lessons. So each Blossoms PBL unit is developed to provide the teacher everything he or she needs to navigate through the rough, potentially rough waters of a three to five week uh, Blossoms uh, uh, project-based learning unit with a class. And so where does Blossoms appear here? On day one of, the, of, of this three to five week exercise, uh, the teacher shows and then interacts with the class with a, the, the selected Blossoms video unit. So it starts on day one with a class experience and a Blossoms lesson. And then the project follows with that. So that gives the anchor content for the three to five week PBO uh, exercise. So we have completed now, and it's been a lot of work with us for us, but we're very uh, happy with it, six Blossoms PBO units. And I don't have uh, the time today to go through in detail all six of them. I thought I'd just indicate what the six are, and then we might drill down and do a little bit more detail on one of them. Okay, so. With Blossoms day one, as I said, the PBL exercise has the teacher present the lead off Blossoms lesson to the class. And the one I'll be talking about is called flaw, the project based learning I'll be talking about is flaws of averages. And this flaws of averages was originally done mm, seven or eight years ago by Dan Livengood and Rhonda Jordan, here they are. At the time they were doctoral students uh, at MIT at the Institute for Data Systems and Society. And now uh, Dan is working high tech in Seattle, Washington, and Rhonda has a distinguished position at the World Bank in Washington, DC. And, but they did, they, did a wonderful, uh, they did a wonderful job with this lesson. Okay, so after they experienced it on day one, the students with appropriate directions and guidance by their teacher, uh, they're charged with a multi-week PBL exercise. And uh, the teacher provides continual support throughout and also our website provides continual support throughout. So when the students have any questions about, you know, oh my God, what do I do? One of our, one of our team members is not working uh, up to speed here. Uh, there's a lot of advice for, this, for the uh, students as well. So let's just talk about the six, just have one slide each on each of the six uh, PBL units we have. One of my favorites is Tragedy of the Commons. You might've heard of this originally the idea of Boston Commons way back when in history, uh, you could graze a cow on it. And so first the, the first farmer puts a cow on, uh, eats some grass and gives milk and it gets fat and happy. And then nine more farmers follow suit and soon there are 10 cows on Boston Common and all the cows are happy and the grass is growing, milk is coming. And eventually there's 20 cows and eventually 30 cows and 40 cows. Eventually there are, there are more cows desiring grass, then the grass can replenish. If the grass is not growing, the cows shrink and become uh, unable to give milk and the whole system crashes. So that's a metaphor for 
uh, free resources that are around us in all kinds of ways and uh, that are being abused and overused and perhaps collapsing. So the question in this PBL lesson is how do we restore these resources to a better state? Green chemistry, uh, the driving question there is how can we become a sustainable community through the 12 principles of green chemistry? This is an excellent lesson. We don't have time to hear to list the 12 principles, but it's an excellent lesson. Special properties of water. The special properties of water was uh, created by uh, William Andrake, who was at Swampscott Middle School, uh, soon retiring from there. He's su such a superb teacher. His blossom, this starts with his blossoms lesson, which, and he's uh, standing on the, on the shore of Swampscott by the ocean and carrying two glasses of water, equal glasses of water. And uh, he then says, well, suppose I put an ice cube in each of these two glasses of water. This one is salt water. This one is fresh water. In which glass will the ice cube melt faster? And from that thing of being able just to hold two glasses of water with ice cubes, he's able in, in, in a one hour blossoms lesson to expand from that small little universe to ocean currents flowing around the world. It's, uh, it's unbelievable. And uh, then he expands in, in, this, in this PBL unit, he expands that even further and has wonderful exercises for the uh, students. User-centered design, how can we resolve problems in our community by employing user-centered design? Complex systems. This one starts out with uh, motivated by a lesson we did in 2009 on the H1N1 pandemic influenza. And it says if we view COVID-19, which is our current problem, or flu as complex systems, how can we analyze them and, uh, uh, and, and, and make them less stressful for us all? And then uh, one we're gonna go into in depth here, in depth, pun slightly intended here. Here we have a non-swimmer who's gonna cross a body of water where there's a sign at the water's edge says average depth three feet. And the guy is a uh, five foot uh, nine inches tall. And uh, clearly uh, three feet would be maybe up to his waist. He says, well, but the average depth is three feet. Uh, I could certainly get across even though I'm a not swimmer. But it says average depth and it doesn't say, oh, there's a deep, deep part here where it goes down for 10 feet. And there you see our gentleman who's in a suit and tie uh, underwater. So the question here is how do we better understand averages? What information have they given us? And in what ways may they be misleading us? And so that's the thing I thought I would drill down a little bit on. So if you drill down on our Blossoms lesson, again, I, I, all this is open source, freely available. Uh, down to level two, the driving question is at the, at the top. And we have a big idea of the lesson. Students will learn, students will be able to. In the upper right-hand corner is the video that they can, they can play again if they want. So let's look at what students will learn here. So how many situations that focus on average uh, can, uh, will the averages distort the reality of the data or give misinterpretation? Uh, what about histograms showing the distributions? And how do we construct histograms? How do we collect data and construct uh, histograms? And from the, from the histograms, we can look at the uh, extremes of min minima, maxima. We can look at the median, uh, which is the halfway point. And we can look at the mode, which is the most likely point. And we can get, understand the definitions of these. And the students all of a sudden get a more sophisticated idea of data. And then averages are just one measure of, 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 of a distribution. And to really have a comprehensive understanding of the situation, you need the distribution. And then you can talk about all those other measures. So what will the students be able to do? Well, the students will be able to distinguish between situations where averages are fine and others where we need more things like the distributions, like the median mode, et cetera. And more than that, the students are gonna learn how to collect the data themselves, got a data collection strategy. And uh, in the project they're gonna be assigned, that, 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 that project has to do with safety, some aspect of safety in their community. They're actually gonna collect data which is gonna be distributed and, and shown on histograms. And they're gonna be integrate the data and, and, and compute the mean, median, and mode and all those things and interpret them. And hopefully then write up a report on, uh, 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 of their safety project, which could benefit 
relevant community officials and in some sense make the community safer for everybody. And then they're gonna present that report to the class, to the teacher, to invited parents, and to hopefully invited community members whose responsibility that safety issue is. So that's what they'll be able to do. Okay, so that's level two. Um, and we have level three down there says getting started. So let's, let's pretend we're clicking on level three, we're getting started and it looks like this. Now, 90% of the content that helps the teachers, that helps the students do project-based learning as at this level. So getting started. So uh, how do we do this in finite time? Well, let's look at project-based learning tools down here. Let, let's click, pretend we're clicking on that and we end up with project-based learning tools. So we see that uh, this is a resource page that we think the student teams are gonna find useful. And uh, let, let's, let's focus on this. They have the driving question is there. So they wanna know about the, what the driving question is for their particular project. We have a project tracker, which uh, they're gonna have to, you know, we're gonna treat them as adults. And as an adult team working on a project, they're gonna assign different responsibilities to different people on the team. And they're gonna have a schedule of milestones and they're gonna have dates where these milestones are to be achieved. So this is the project tracker and they have other, other tools too, task log and a, a team agreement as to what, who's gonna do what and when, and even a team contract that they might sign. Now we don't expect that every team will do all of these things, but these are project-based learning tools to help them develop at an adult level really, uh, so the soft skills they need for the 21st century. What else can we do there getting started? Let's look at the teacher questions because the teachers are, you know, oh my God, how do I control this? How do I, how do I manage this? I don't know what's gonna happen. So let's look at the teacher questions. Do I have extra time to undertake a PBL lesson with everything else I have to do? You have to grade homework and prepare classes. I don't have a TA, blah, 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 blah. Well, we, we offer answers to these questions. Uh, and you can, you can read it here faster than I'm not gonna read it to you. Uh, number two, wanna get behind covering the curriculum material and the common core and NGSS standards. I have so many things I've got to cover, state mandated curricula, et cetera. The parents are on top of me to do this and that. Well, the idea is, well, why don't you just start out with one PBL unit in the next academic year, see how that goes, learn from it, kind of fine tune your approach, and then the next academic year, you could try one in the fall and one in the spring. And, and hopefully that will grow over time and your skill will be good and uh, you will be less uh, anxious about it. Oh, well, let's go down here to common concerns during PBO and how to handle them. Student comes up to the teacher, I'm worried that my team won't work well together. Again, do they have role playing role, uh, 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 games that they can play with each other to, to figure out how to work more, uh, more closely together. How do I respond? So the teacher says, how do I respond to students who are paralyzed by being assigned a problem that doesn't have a right or wrong answer? If you think about it, it's the A and A plus students who dutifully circle the correct answer on let's say particularly math homework problems, but also physics and chemistry. Biology is a little bit uh, less of the circling the correct answer. And they're very proud that they get their A or A plus because they've been assigned a problem that they can do a uh, kind of a formulaic approach, turn the crank and get the answer, put a box around it and smile and they get their A or A plus. Well, these students perhaps are the most anxious about getting involved with something that does not have a correct answer. It's kind of vague and they've got to have to specify a process that gets them to not the answer, but a bunch of conclusions and recommendations these sorts of things. Or a parent or a guardian may come to the teacher and say, I want my little Johnny or Janie to get into Harvard uh, and, uh, or Oxford. And for that, they need an SAT score of such and such and such and such. And I'm worried that if they spend time on PBL, their SAT score will be less. Well, yeah, and how do, you, how do you respond to something like this? And we have, uh, we have answers that, uh, how to address that. Or uh, this, this is one of my favorites. This is one of my favorites. How do I respond to students who've gone down a dead end and don't know how to proceed? So they've, they've gone down, they've spent maybe three or four days working in this particular way and all of a sudden they're stuck. They're stuck and they don't know what to do. And uh, my favorite answer here is Thomas Edison. 
you might recall that Thomas Edison failed, you know, 999 times to create the incandescent light bulb. And on the thousandth time, he invented it. And so a reporter asked him once, how did it feel to fail 1,000 times? This is to Edison. And Thomas Edison rep replied, I didn't fail 1,000 times. The light bulb was an invention with 1,000 steps. Great success is built on failure, frustration, even catastrophe, unquote. That's what Thomas Edison said. And I think the students should understand that, that if you don't fail on occasion, you're not thinking out of the box enough. You're not taking intellectual risks that will come up with new things that others haven't known before. Okay, so what else do we have? Well, we have something called the project calendar. And you will not believe the detail of help materials we have both for the teacher and the student in the project calendar. Basically, it's a project calendar for anywhere from a three week to a five week project. And uh, for each of our six lessons, we assume it's, you know, one we might assume it's a three week one, a five week, but the teacher has a great, great, bill of, a great deal of flexibility on how he or she uh, organizes this. But we, for each day, with day one, day two, we have, a, uh, we have homework that can be downloaded as a PDF or Word format. We have instructions to the teacher, uh, all, all sorts of things like this. And so uh, on day one of uh, Flaws of Averages, they, they, the students see the, uh, uh, the video and they interact with the video. And, uh, and then they're asked some questions. They're asked some questions for the, for the first homework. And the first homework is things like, what did you find most interesting in this video lesson? Uh, what did you find confusing about it? Uh, one of my favorites is come up with one or two examples uh, that relates to Rhonda's question about cookies, about cookies. And her, her question about cookies to, to, to Dan, she says, Dan, here under these two uh, plates, under these two plates, in each of them I have two circular cookies. One set of circular cookies has an average, dia has an average diameter of eight centimeters. The other set of two cookies has an average diameter of seven centimeters. Which would you prefer, Dan? And Dan says, well, that's clearly obvious, Rhonda. I'm gonna go for the, the plate that has the uh, uh, cookies with average diameter that's larger, which is the eight. And then Rhonda shows the two cookies, the, the two cookie plates. And the, the cookie plate with the average diameter of seven has one cookie whose diameter is half a centimeter and the other one whose diameter is like 10 centimeters. So the area of the two with the lower average, which is seven, has is actually more cookie in that way. So uh, and that was kind of a flabbergasting thing. And there's a technical reason for that, which we don't have time to go through. But that's just one example about where you have nonlinearities non in the system. And here the nonlinearities, it goes with a square because the area is pi r square of the circular cookie. Uh, you can't think linearly in terms of its, its radius and diameter. Okay, so I like that a lot. And um, so let's go on, so day two. So basically the next several days now uh, on the next assignment is that they're supposed to look at the news and, and talk to their friends and parents about how averages are, are appearing in the news and um, whether they think that some of these averages are, are good or bad or, or need distributions. And um, so, if you think about this, right now with COVID-19, there's something called R0, which is the basic reproductive number. Uh, uh, that's the mean number of new infections that a newly infected person will create. And R0 for uh, COVID-19 has been talked about somewhere between 2.5 and 3.2 or something like this. Well, if the students think about this and look at the definition of R0 and they read about COVID-19, they read about 80% of the uh, people who are infected with COVID-19 infect nobody else. So their reinfection rate is zero. And then about 80% of the infections of COVID-19 come from super spreaders. And the super spreaders might infect 20, 30, 50, 100 more people. But the average over the entire population is let's say three. So there's an example about where the average is you're really misleading in terms of the physics of the, of the situation. And that's the, something that the students could, could find on one of these early uh, assignments. We give them two or three early assignments about averages. Another one is 
collect data on yourself. How many hours do you sleep a night? Uh, how many ounces of fluid do you take every day? Um, um, things like this, just so they can calculate data and they can calculate the averages and maybe get other measures besides just the averages. These are all warm up exercises to, whoa, day four, five, six, or seven, we'll skip and we'll go to day eight. So day eight is the big assignment. So on day eight, all the teams are, are together and they've made contracts with themselves about how they're gonna operate. And then they're assigned, they're, each team is assigned a project. And the way we've done it in this class is these projects are all dealing with safety issues in their community. These are real safety issues in the community, not something made up out of a, out of a textbook. And so we have fire safety and distance to the nearest fire hydrant, driver's intersection safety, smart traffic lights, sidewalk safety, playground safety, or none of the above project where the uh, teachers and the student team, the teacher and student team can negotiate uh, some other safety project. And so the teacher provides an overview of each project. And then we have some collaborative uh, safe way of, of, uh, of figuring out which team gets which, which project. Okay, so let's look at the driver's uh, intersection safety. That's the one we're gonna drill down on a little, a little bit. Uh, my own interest in this is here's, here, here's an intersection where you see there's a lot of shrubs and bushes at that particular corner there. So if a car comes down from the Northeast to the Southwest on, on, that, uh, on the right-hand street, uh, it cannot really see whether there's a, a fast moving car coming from North to South on the vertical street. My own interest in this is quite personal. Uh, I was almost killed once <laughs> in a Lexington intersection that had this problem. And uh, my son, Eric, we got taken into the middle school was also in the car. And uh, I'll never forget what he said, dad. And I didn't know what he was talking about, but I jammed on the brakes. And by jamming on the brakes, I stopped, we stopped from being uh, sideswiped by a speeding car. We must've been going at least 50 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour zone. So, and, but the idea is here, particularly in suburban communities, because of uh, a lack of attention to this, there are a lot of intersections which are unsafe in terms of visibility. So this is driver's intersection safety. And, and you can see the, the visibility triangle right there. So there's a little bit of geometry involved, but there's a lot of geometry involved in, in this study. And so these street intersections, some with stop signs and some without stop signs, um, might have fences, might have trees, uh, bushes, um, shrubs that are in the way that have maybe gotten in the way over the past several years. Maybe the intersection hasn't been attended to uh, by officials for 20, 30, 40 years. So the idea of this project is to have, it's assign the students to ask their parents who are drivers and to ask uh, their parents of, of, of their friends, you know, which intersections in our community do you think are unsafe? Did you have any near accidents or real accidents at any of them? Let us know. And the team will then go out and given the time that they have, maybe they'll model and inspect 10 to 20 different intersections, take photographs, take measurements, uh, create the visibility triangle, and come back with recommendations as to maybe, they, maybe they'll order the uh, intersections from what they view as most dangerous to least dangerous of the ones they've looked at, and prepare a report, and uh, this report should be scientifically valid, and then, then, pre then present it orally uh, to the class, to the teacher, to the students, to their parents, and hopefully, uh, to the individuals in the Department of Transportation in their community who, whose responsibility it is to have safe intersections. So that's basically the idea of what this project is. Now we do not give them a recipe for the science and technology and geometry of how to proceed. So the actual creation of the work in the, in the geometry and the collection of data and knowing about uh, means versus distributions. For instance, there's a distribution of where the car that's stopping will stop. There's a distribution of the speed of oncoming cars. Here are places where averages are not sufficient in order to, to, to model the physics of the situation. So that's what's going on there. So we do not spoon feed them at the end. They have to create their own methodology for doing this report. But we give them lots of references and websites and uh, so they can learn that way as well. So, that's our story. We're about halfway through, and I, 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 I promised Dr. Naveed that I'd be through it about a half time, uh, about a half an hour. 
And so those are Blossom's PBL units designed for teachers. And the kind of detail that we had on the schedule and all those helpful things, the PDF files on each day to help the students and the teacher, we had that level of detail, if you can believe it or not, for each of the other five PBL lessons as well. So we're very proud of this. It's probably the, one of the most ambitious projects we ever undertook under the MIT Blossoms uh, flag. And so each is a complete instructional scaffolding for the teacher. And um, there may be other uh, open source uh, sites with comparable content, but if there are, we're not aware of them. And please email me if you are aware of them, uh, rclarson at mit.edu. We'd like to learn about them and collaborate with them. So the scaffolding is what we created. Uh, before I turn it over to questions and answers, um, I want to thank sincerely Elizabeth Murray, who for 12 years has served dutifully and fantastically as Blossom's project manager with great passion. And she must have put in 80 hour weeks as their, being the director of the Blossom's project based learning project, uh, which that just finished at the end of August. So thank you, Elizabeth, for everything that you've done. We also had Tara Connolly as our key staff member on project-based learning. Thank you, Tara. And uh, the financial resources came from two foundations, the Open Education Resources Foundation, Link Miller, chairman, and from the Lansbury Foundation, Glenn Straley was key responsible for that. He had, uh, was the treasurer of the Lansbury Foundation. Thank you very much, Professor Larson. That was very interesting. And having been associated with Blossoms in its early years, I can see a beautiful and a very logical progression into PBL for the, the initial Blossoms work that you did. So I'll, I'll hand over now to my colleague, uh, Dr. Sanjaya Mishra, lead into the conclusion. Over to you, Sanjaya. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Larson. Um, your, your emphasis on uh, the use of video in and looking at the future resonates with a lot of things that we at the Commonwealth of Learning has been trying to do to promote open distance online learning to reach large number of people, uh, uh, to scale education, to reach uh, the person in the in, in the in the uh, the queue, last person in the queue, uh, particularly to also promote science, technology, engineering, mathematics education through open distance and online learning, and particularly uh, the way MIT Blossom courses has been designed to use multiple video resources, chunking of the resources are all those things that uh, talks about new pedagogical approaches of open and distance learning. So um, thank you very much for these reassuring words uh, for the world of open and distance learning, the way uh, things are going. Uh, Currently, it looks like the future of learning is uh, open, uh, blended online learning, uh, video-based learning, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, on behalf of the Commonwealth of Learning and uh, the International Partnership for Distance and Online Learning, uh, Open Door at Commonwealth of Learning, and my colleagues and on my own behalf, I. Uh, would like to thank you for the time you have spent and the excellent work that you have uh, done at MIT Blossom for um, the world to see. All these resources are available with an open license so other people can make use of. So thank you very much. Uh, we have several people today on the audience uh, or watching this uh, session. The session will also be available as uh, a short video clipping of the particularly of your uh, le um, lecture and demonstration part uh, for wider audience to watch. Thank you very much for everyone from around the world who have joined today um, and have asked so many interesting questions that we could ask and get clarification professor, from Professor Larson. Thank you very much. Thanks to my uh, colleagues at uh, Commonwealth of Learning, Dr. Balaji for joining, uh, Dr. Marriott, and of course, uh, of Professor Malik, who actually from the very beginning wanted uh, Professor Larson to be here and to speak. And uh, MIT Blossom is one of the earliest uh, 
uh, agency that joined our open door platform and it all happened because of uh, professor malik thank you professor malik um i would be failing in my duty if i don't uh, thank my colleague na ajile who has been diligently working behind the screen to make all these things happen at uh, open door at call uh, thank you everyone for joining us today we will um, make our best efforts to make the video recording available to all of you for sharing with your colleagues as soon as possible thank you all have great day wherever you are stay safe thank you very much